Einstein's second postulate, similarly to the first postulate, throws out some of our 19th century views about how to formulate laws of physics. If you remember, in the 19th century, physics, physicists ran into problems when they insisted on two assumptions. The first being an absolute rest frame, known as the ether. And in this formulation, all velocities could be measured with respect to this absolute rest. And the second problem was Galilean relativity, that is that there is an absolute time and all, t all times can be judged uh, on that absolute time scale and in fact that impacts how we evaluate coordinates. Einstein restarted the formulation of all mechanics based on two very different postulates. The first was that all observers would agree on the speed of light. It would always be c irrespective of what frame of reference the observer is in. The second was that the laws of physics will be the same in all reference frames. It may be that the values of quantities like force or momentum would be different, but the physical laws like conservation of momentum or conservation of energy would be the same. In this short section, we're going to discuss the, the implication for the laws of physics being the same or the second postulate. In fact, we're somewhat familiar with of formulations of physics in which it's not so important what frames of reference you're in. If we think back to uh, the, the case of Faraday's law of induction, in fact Einstein pointed out that there's no uh, absolute reference frame here and in fact this is where he gained insight in, into the idea that there's no, there's no value in the idea of an absolute reference frame. He, has to, he pointed out that it's, it's important to think that there would be the same physics that would result in this case a current flowing in a circuit irrespective of what frame of reference we, in which we observe a reaction. And in the case of Faraday's law of induction, you might remember that it doesn't matter whether or not we move a, co a magnet inside of a coil or we move a coil over a magnet. In either case, there is a change in magnetic flux and that's what causes a voltage in the circuit and therefore a current in the circuit. So the physics is the same, no matter whether you're standing on the coil and watching the magnet move toward you or you're standing on the magnet and watching the coil move toward you. Only the relative motion in the system matters. And in fact, you might see generators that work on this principle in either of the two ways possible. You might see moving coils inside of a magnet, or you might see moving magnets inside of coils. Either way, induction works. Another example worth considering is what is the force on a charge that's moving near a wire? Imagine a wire that carries a current I, and there's a charge Q that's moving anti-parallel to the direction of the current flow. If you're standing out there in the lab at rest relative to the wire, you would say, oh, I see a current, and therefore there's going to be a magnetic field uh, propagating around the, the current using the right-hand rule. Instantly, then, you would think, I can deduce that there's a force acting on that charge, and that force will be Q times the velocity vector crossed into the B field. And in this particular picture, the force points out of the page toward you. Well, now suppose you're in a frame of reference that's following the charge. You're not standing at rest in the lab, but you're moving along with the charge at some velocity V. If you're that observer standing on the charge, then you think the charge is at rest, or V is zero. If V is zero in the frame that you're in, then there can't be a QV cross B force. So if we want the laws of physics to be the same, in other words, that there is a force on this charge, we have to think about what is it that creates the force. Well, you would report that there's a linear charge density, an amount of charge Q per unit length Z of the wire. And as a result, you would say that there's an electric field, which you might remember is lambda over two pi epsilon naught R, that points radially away from the wire. As a result, there's a force Q times E, which again points out of the page or radially away from the wire, and actually you running along with the charge would agree with the person who said that there's a magnetic field. There is a force acting on the charge and it pushes the charge away from the wire. The only difference is you would say it's due to an electric field. The other observer would say it's due to a magnetic field. So here we see that the instigation of the force, the, the nature of the force, is somewhat different. It's not invariant to say it's an E field or there it's a B field, but it is an invariant that there will be a force, and all observers agree on that. 
So in this sense, we have uh, early insight into ways in which we need to recast some of our laws and be somewhat independent of whether it's E's and B's and more dependent on is there a force or not. In summary, in Einstein's relativity, what we really focus on is that the outcomes will be invariant. The outcomes being things like momentum is conserved, or energy is conserved, or that there is certain kinds of motion of objects. We might have to change the expressions depending on what frame of reference we're in, though, in order to make this invariance hold. We might have to write down a new formulation for the momentum of a particle, or we might have to write down a new formulation for addition of velocities or relative velocities, or we might have to write down a new formulation for the force. It might not be exactly F equals MA, but what we really want to happen is that force causes changes in momentum, and momentum conservation holds, and energy conservation holds. Those are the kinds of things that Einstein focused on, and the particulars of E fields and B fields, or um, who's the, the relative motion, who's the motion that's causing the, the change in flux, those are less important.